music for us. It's been great to have Jan back on the organ too, isn't that, isn't that a blessing? And we have some others that are participating in all our choir people. As I assume you were paying attention and thinking of the words, that sounded suspiciously Christmas-like, didn't it? Yeah, that's okay, that's all right. Yes, it sounded like We Three Kings kind of a theme and variations maybe. And uh, by the way, I almost preached that message today, I almost did it, it would have been fine. You know, we did that series on the road to Bethlehem, right? And there's one more trip in the Christmas story to Bethlehem, and that was the three, the, the, we assume it's three, the three Magi, the three wise men in Matthew chapter 2, you remember that? But they, they came a little late, probably almost two years late, but they were there to worship the king. Well, I've decided to move in a different direction. Today is New Year's, so a new, not only a new uh, Sunday, new day, New, new first day of the week, new first day of the month, and a new first day of the year. So welcome to 2023. We're glad to have each of you here today to worship. We want to look at something. This is a little bit thematic. Here's what we're going to look at. Walking in newness of life in the new year. Kind of looking at Romans chapter 6. There are two things I want to do for us uh, today. These are, kind of, these are kind of the purpose statements for the, for the message today is I want to connect this phrase in, uh, in Romans 6.4, walk in newness of life. We're going to explore it, we're going to connect it. Uh, the idea of walking in newness of life, connect it to the new year. Uh, connect it to, that is, new opportunities to serve Christ and grow in our faith and mature in, in our uh, development, in our Christ-likeness, all those kind of things, both individually and corporately. So we want to connect it in that way. And I want to remind you... Um, you know, that phrase, walk in newness of life. We are new creatures. That's 2 Corinthians 5. We're, we've been made, if you're here today and are born again, you have been made new. You're a new creation. Uh, you're not just the old you uh, warmed back up or, uh, or painted, whitewashed on the outside. True Christianity, biblical Christianity, bibi biblical salvation, uh, new birth, is a birth. We have been born again, spiritually made alive. And so that's true of you here today, and I think it is for most of you. I hope all of you, but most of you. Um, that's what I want to do is connect that newness. We are new in Christ and remind you that that is an opportunity. The goal now, that what we have now been designed for by God is not just, hey, I'm new and that's it. But because I am new in Christ, there is a new walk that, that grows day by day. And I also want to, in this, still in the same purpose statement, uh, remind you, there's nothing wrong with New Year's resolutions. That's, those are great. Uh, many of you probably utilize it. Some of you probably don't. Um, in any event, you don't have to wait, you know, if, if we get to next week, you don't have to wait till 2024 to make some changes. You, each day, each day is a new day to start right with God, isn't it? You remember in Lamentations, I think it's chapter 3, the mercies of the Lord uh, are new, what? Every morning. Uh, that's the basis of that song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. We, we have new mercies every day. And so this idea of walking in newness, I want to connect to that. It's a new year, it's, it's a new week, it's a new day. Uh, in, in an hour, it'll be a new hour. <laughs> and I, it's a new hour, that's a new moment to serve Christ. And so I want to encourage you that. But there's a lot in this, in this text. I also want to reconnect, those of you who have, with superior memories, We'll remember that a little bit ago, like in October, November, we were, we were in a series in Ephesians. And so I want to actually reconnect or re-engage with that Ephesians series and uh, throughout this message and kind of give a summation or a, a synopsis or a, a, uh, a preview of where we're headed in Ephesians. We will be in Romans 6 in a moment, but actually in light of that, go with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And when we left off in the series, and I don't even remember the exact date, it was a week or so before Thanksgiving, because we took a break for Thanksgiving, and then we, we have been uh, in the Christmas mode for a little bit, which is great. But I'm, I'm trying to get us back in Ephesians, and it, uh, the actual series will start back up on the 22nd. We have a couple more uh, interludes still, but this, this re-engages your mind in the new year. But we covered, when we, when we ended, we'd done six or seven messages covering pretty quickly chapters one to three. The foundations of our faith, uh, the fact that the church is God's new plan, uh, the fact in chapter two that we are saved uh, by grace through faith alone. That, that's the, so we've laid some doctrinal foundations. 
And I'll remind you, that is Paul's typical pattern. Uh, very regularly in his epistles, first half of the book is, is more teaching or more doctrine. So he's laid the foundations of God's sovereignty, uh, things with election, things with salvation, things with the, the basis of the church founded on Christ and those kind of things. And we left off there, end of chapter 3. Chapter 4, you'll notice the first couple verses read this way. I, therefore, prisoner for the Lord, urge you to what? Walk. Urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And in essence, uh, Paul in the next three chapters, 4, 5, and 6, the second half of the epistle now become the very practical, mostly applications of what he has founded doctrinally early. And the, the biggest summary word, there's some other words, but the biggest summary word is walking. Walking worthy. And so I want to take you into Romans chapter 6. Paul uses this word walk quite regularly. And we will discover. So go with me to Romans 6. This is our text for today. Very parallel. And I'm, I'm using it, like I said, to reconnect with Ephesians. And for today, for this week, this month, this new year, uh, to connect new year with new walk. Keep walking in newness of life. But Romans chapter 6, very parallel concept uh, to what Paul's developing in chapters 4, 5, and 6 of Ephesians. And here, the key phrase is going to be in verse number 4. Uh, walk in newness of life. And so I want to I want to work through about four things here, mostly in verses 1 through 4. But walking in newness of life from Romans chapter 6. And what we have here is um, the same uh, principle that, that Paul is going to develop actually in chapters 6 through 8 is the same thing. He develops, he has already developed in Romans, particularly in chapters 3 and 4, uh, justification by faith. We are, we are declared righteous. We are, we are seen uh, in God's eyes as righteous by faith alone in what Christ has accomplished. And having developed that theme, justification by faith alone in chapters 3 and 4, he now has moved through chapter 5, a lot of grace things, into chapter 6. And that's where we find ourselves. And what he is going to propose, what he is going to develop for us, is this new life. Uh, that is, since we have been justified, the, the plan of God, what God has designed, is that we ought to walk in newness of life. And so I want to cover under these four ideas. Uh, there's a question and answer. There's actually three or four questions here, but a couple key ones in verse 1, uh, which is, should we continue in sin? And then we want to develop in verse number 2, Part of the answer is a principle, and we want to grab onto this. We died to sin. What does that mean? How did it happen? So we want to develop that for a few moments. And then verse 3, our position, uh, that is our connection to Christ, our union with Christ. We've been joined together with him. And um, again, I, this terminology I use regularly, so I've tried to, I try to use it pretty consistently. But this is that positional truth, that we are in Christ. And this forms the, the doctrinal or theological or spiritual reality. God sees us this way. That's our position. And so our, our union with Christ in verse 3, and what that leads to, and that's mostly trying to alliterate the possibility, that is what God has then designed because we're connected to Christ, is that we walk in newness of life. So that's where we're headed in these, in these moments. Allow me to develop this for you. Uh, and it overlaps again with Ephesians very well. We'll connect it a little bit later in the, in the service, in the message. So here, the, the summation of this section is that we have connected living. We're connected to Christ. We're united with Christ in his death and in his life, his resurrection life. And the, the, the key thought out of this whole thing is our connection to Christ and our connection, our joining with Christ, our position starts with our justification by faith alone in Christ. And that position, that justification position, being right with God in his eyes, that position provides the means and the foundation by which we can live victoriously. And that's what's very interesting here. Back under the justification passages in Romans 3 and 4, the wording, the phrasing, the theme of living doesn't really come up. It's just we're guilty and we need to be made right. We need to be declared righteous. 
And that's what happens in Romans 3 and 4. And on that basis, uh, Paul develops in chapter 5 grace issues and so on. And here in chapter 6, he is now going to say, because of what we are in Christ, justified, here's what we ought to be doing. And so I want to develop that. Uh, so our connection to Christ, our, our joining, being joined with Christ, our position provides the means by which we can live victoriously. And you saw it as we read, I trust, just the first 14 verses. It actually continues all the way to the end of chapter 8, 6, 7, and 8. Quite a bit of text develops this theme of victorious living, grace reigning in life. Instead of death, uh, sin reigning in death. And so the, the object of the Christian life is to live for Christ and experience that new life we have in Christ. So the first one here is a question and an answer. And Paul says in verse 1, uh, and kind of a rhetorical question, but he, he asks this question, uh, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? And he's going to answer it, uh, by no means. Uh, you might, King James, God forbid. Uh, other one, you know, absolutely not. This is, now, but we raise the question, we're going to pause there, this is the question and answer. He develops, he says, what shall we say then? Uh, based on what I've just been talking about, and I don't have uh, enough time to cover chapter 5 in any detail, but in chapter 5, he has said that grace is such a thing Grace is such a powerful operational principle of God's nature and working that where sin abounds, grace superabounds. Uh, and, and when God displays his grace, it brings glory to his name. And so the question that comes up is, uh, to a reader, a hypothetical reader at least of Paul's, well, Paul, if, if uh, sinning, uh, just makes God heap more grace. That's just his response. He's a God of grace. If my sinning uh, brings more grace from God and that brings glory to him, uh, boy, it kind of makes sense. I should go on sinning that God would keep pouring the glory out. And I'll make two points. Paul's answer is very direct, right? He says, should we continue in sin in order that grace would keep on being poured out, keep on abounding? The next verse says, God forbid, or absolutely not, by no means. That's not what grace is supposed to do. But I will raise the issue for you. I will raise the question for you to think on. The question was not uh, without thought. In other words, there is some understanding. The application has been twisted. But an understanding of grace, grace means God lavishes on us his goodness that we do not deserve. And so as we contemplate grace, and as you and I grow in our walk with the Lord, we, come, we, we begin by saying, oh yeah, grace means undeserved merit. And then if you're like me, in the experience of walking with the Lord over time, and by time I mean months and years and even decades, we begin to say, well, yeah, it's, it's merit, it's goodness. And boy, God is good, isn't he? And we, we start thinking, wow, grace means God is good to me. And we, we praise him for it. We, we understand that a little more. And then we cycle back through and we're like, wait a second, that goodness of God is undeserved. I really don't deserve it. And the more we grow, the more we realize we didn't deserve it at all. Because I think there's still something in us, it's just human nature. We make this statement, grace is undeserved merit. It's, it's un, unearned kindness. But what I really mean is I don't, I don't really deserve most of it. You know, that, that seems to be the human thinking. When we think on it more, as we grow in the Bible, we realize we don't deserve any of it at all. And therefore, the, the question, I'm, what I'm telling you is that Paul's rhetorical question, should we continue in sin so that grace can abound? It is a misapplication of grace, but it is not entirely a misunderstanding of grace. Grace is God showing undeserved kindness. It just goes on and on. And the text before, in fact, in verse, uh, chapter 5, um, verse 20, the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that, with the result that, as sin reigned in death, uh, grace also might reign through righteousness unto life. And so, where it is, grace is an amazing thing. 
The question is, should we continue in sin? That's, that we've moved from being justification principles, we're justified, justified by faith alone because of what Christ has done. And Paul is now saying, based on that, what God has done in justification through Christ, uh, now grace is operational. Grace has brought us to a justified state. And now the question in chapters 5, and here particularly 6, 7, and 8 is, how then shall we live? What is, what is Christian living supposed to look like? Should we just go on sinning so that we get more grace? And he says, absolutely not. That's point number one. Point number two is an explanation. And this is a key principle in the whole set. And in verse 2 we read, uh, he answers, absolutely not, by no means. But then he says this, How can we who died to sin still live in it? How can we who died to sin still live in it? There are a couple of, of very important, relatively basic, but really, really important principles out of this. Number one is a principle, and by principle here I mean a statement of fact or a, a foundational truth. He says it very simply in, in, in verse 2b, how can we who died to sin, how can we who died to sin still live in it? The principle is we have died to sin. Our relationship to, this, to sin and to the sin nature post-justification, post-salvation, is one of a position of death. We have died to it. It, it is no longer meant to have uh, operational control. Sin is not meant to, to reign in the believer's life. Why? Because legally, uh, forensically, positionally, we have died to it. That is how uh, God sees us in Christ. This is the joined together, and we're kind of we're starting to bleed over into, into point number three, our position, our union with Christ. But how did we die to sin? We'll develop in a moment more in, in verse three, but because we are connected by faith to Christ and his work on the cross, we participate in his death to sin. We died to sin. What that brings up, that's our position. Uh, that, that's what's happened. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Now here's the second op observation with that. This, I, this principle of we died to sin. That is our standing. Those who have been justified by faith have died to sin. That's their relationship. The question that's raised here, very interesting, a couple things with it. Second point here. How can we who died to sin still live in it? You'll notice, number one, that the phrase living in sin or still living in sin parallels continuing in sin. So Paul, in the first verse, says, are, are we supposed to continue in sin to get more grace? In verse number two, he says, how can we do that? We died to sin. How can we who died to sin still continue, that is, still live in it? And one of the observations, the second point here, is to consider that because we have died to sin, it does not mean that we can no longer sin. And you know, we, even though we have positionally, uh, that is in our attachment to Christ, our, our relationship to sin is we have died to sin, the sin principle. That's the legal standing. But the truth is, each one of us, including Paul himself, uh, but each one of us still sins. This, re, this death to sin does not mean that sin no longer occurs in our lives. We still sin. But what Paul is saying in this wording, how can we who died to sin, that's our standing, how can we still live in it? What he is developing, what he is hinting at, what he is kind of using a word play for is when you and I live in sin... That is, when we commit acts of sin, when we're in sin, sinfulness, we are not actually living as we were meant to live. It's not actually alive. Does that make sense? The Christian life is a new creation in Christ uh, where grace reigns in righteousness for life. And when we live it that way, when we walk in this newness of life, now we are experience, experiencing Christian living. When you and I get off the path, to use the walking analogy, when we, when we stray from the Lord, 
uh, and we are not walking with him, we're sinning, we are no longer actually living the Christian life as it was meant. It is actually a death-filled kind of a life. And so this, this phrase is, is, is quite, uh, quite pregnant, quite poignant with, with meaning. How can we who died to sin, statement, principle, we died to sin. If that's true, and it is, then how can we still live in it? Answer, we still sin, but when we're sinning, we're not living. We're not living properly. We're not living as a Christian should. We move on to the third one, a little further explanation, verse number three. Uh, don't you know, aren't you aware that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? And I take a moment here in verse number three just to remind you, Paul's used a question here, uh, a reminder. Don't you remember, don't you know that all of us who were baptized were baptized into uh, the, the death of, of Christ Jesus? Without getting too far into the weeds, uh, allow me to suggest or allow me to, to conclude for you, with you, <laughs> Uh, that this is not water baptism. This isn't believer's baptism. So we understand that the Bible teaches there is a, there's a specific rite. There's actually two in, in the Baptist tradition from the Bible. Uh, communion, which we're going to celebrate next week, uh, is, is one of them. The, the first one, though, is baptism. Believer's baptism or water baptism. And the procedure for that is someone trusts Christ, they, they realize they need Christ, they're a sinner, a guilty before God, and through the witness of others, through the preaching of the word, through the reading of scripture, they come to realize, I need a savior. And they put their faith in Jesus Christ and what he has done on the cross, and they are born again. They have new life. They're, they're made a new creature in Jesus Christ by faith. And a little further along, could be the same day, it could be next week, could be down the road a little bit. They learn, they read, they hear. You know, people who have been born again spiritually, it is a good thing. The Bible instructs them to be baptized, to, to follow the Lord, make a public confession of faith in the waters of baptism. And so that's what we, you know, as Baptists, that's part of what we're known for. Is That's a long history lesson we won't get into. But after a person's born again, it, it is a biblical, obedient step to be baptized in the waters of, of baptism. And in doing so, it demonstrates or pictures by going under the water, being buried in the water, it pictures our association, our understanding of Christ's death and our death with him. And then, you know, we do pull the people back up out of the water fairly quickly. I've, you know, I've baptized several and I've never left anyone under there. So we, we bring them back up. And so that pictures coming up out of death into new life with Christ, resurrection living. And it is also a testimony, the, the person who's being baptized, I mean, my normal procedure is to ask, you know, are you saved? Have you trusted Christ? Yes. And do you intend, you know, are you here at the waters of baptism? Do you intend to live for Jesus Christ as best as you can by his help, by his grace? And they answer yes. And that's what this pictures. It pictures our association with, with Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection. And our intention, our desire, our commitment to follow Christ obediently in life. That's water baptism or believer's baptism. That happens after salvation. It has nothing to do with becoming saved. It happens afterwards. Romans 6, verse 3, those who have been... Um, baptized into Christ Jesus, have been baptized into his death, that's not water baptism. There are, there's a lot, uh, interpretively, uh, hermeneutically, there's a lot of confusion if you make this into water baptism. So allow me, without going into a long discourse, just to say this is our positional connection to Christ. This baptism, this association with Christ, this being buried with him, occurs when we put faith in Jesus Christ and God counts or reckons or sees us as attached to Christ in his death. Um, you, you remember in, uh, is it in Galatians, um, I am crucified, Galatians 2.20, do you remember Galatians 2.20? I am crucified with Christ, all right? Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives within me. It is that kind of a thing. 
you, it might not have been explained to you at that moment, to be honest, I was young enough, and it's, it's many moons ago when I came to Christ. I don't remember everything my mom said or every verse that she read that night. So I don't know if she explained everything like, when you get saved, you're attached to Christ in this way. I don't know. But I have learned about it since then. When we came to Christ, when we put faith in him for new life, we, be, we, we participated positionally, participated legally, if that helps you understand. In God's eyes, he associated us with the death of Christ. I am crucified with Christ. That is what's happening here. This is the new birth experience of being connected or joined with or in union with Christ in his death. His death on the cross becomes mine, becomes applied to me. Don't you know, verse 3, that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, that is in his death, have been baptized into his death. And so this is the whole, this is, again, the, the word I will regularly use, have used here pretty consistently, is position. We are with Christ or we're in Christ. In what way? Well, this is one of them. When we are born again by faith, we are connected to his death. His death becomes ours. We, become, we participate in that death. And we have died to sin. We died to sin with Christ. When, and it's called baptism. All right? there, there's a longer study uh, it, that we don't have time for today, but that's the, that's the conclusion. It isn't water baptism. Just allow me to set that aside. If you have questions, you certainly can ask me later. Water baptism confuses this whole thing. That's a different subject. That's a different rite. This is the actual appropriation, the spiritual uh, appropriation or the spiritual um, apprehension, taking part of Christ's death when we put faith in him. And so that's our position. That becomes, that becomes the ground for so much. That is the basis for, for our Christian living is the fact that we are attached to Christ and in him. And I've mentioned this before, but all through Paul especially, the other writers somewhat, but Paul especially, he frequently refers to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's this thing. There, there's more to it, but that, this is the basic. When we put faith in Christ, uh, we're connected to him, and we now participate in his death on the cross. It becomes ours. Now, the final one here, I'm calling it possibility. Uh, it's really designed. This is what God intended. This is, this is the result God is looking for. Verse number four, continuation of his thought. We were buried. That, when we were baptized with him, we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. We're, we're associated with his death. In order that, for the purpose of, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, there's the glory principle, God's glory at work, but we were buried with, with him so that just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too might, that's the possibility, we, it is now what God has designed. Those who have been buried with Christ by faith that is attached to his crucifixion, are now raised to news of life. It's not the, this isn't the future resurrection, although that, that, that's part of the application. It is resurrection life now, today. When you came to Christ, you became associated with him in the tomb, in his death to sin. And just like he was raised by the glory of, of the Father, you now have been raised with him. Why? For what purpose? For what possibility? For what design? That you might walk in newness of life. Let's explore that just a little bit more. What do we mean by walk in newness of life? Well, again, the, when I use the word possibility, I don't want to, I'm not trying to sow doubt that you know, maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't. What I'm saying though is that not everything we do is walking in newness of life. We still do sin. What we want, what God has provided for in Christ is the power, the grace, God's glory that grace would reign in life. And that's what's going to be covered. It's not where we're going right now. But in chapter, the rest of chapter 6, 7, and 8, that's what he deals with. Victorious Christian living based upon the foundation of our justification. But now by walking with Christ, walking as he walked, walking in newness of life, uh, we experience real Christian living and not death even, in, even while we're physically alive. 
The sad part is uh, we probably all know Christians, friends, relatives, loved ones, people from this church, people from other places, who, who we are convinced know Christ. They, maybe you led them to the Lord. And yet they somewhere got discouraged, got upset, got rebellious, got hurt, got something, and they drifted away, and they are no longer living, they're no longer walking regularly in newness of life. What does that mean? Well, it means if they were saved, and I'm, I'm very open to the fact that they very well were saved, they're justified, but that they have drifted away and they are now no longer experiencing Christian living. Uh, I'm, to coin a phrase, they're experiencing Christian death. <laughs> and you know people like this, I, I would suspect. People who, you know, the, the way you recognize them is you believe, you, you understand they are believers, you understand they're saved. But they're lacking in joy. Um, maybe they don't go to church anymore. Maybe they... Maybe they doubt everything about God. Maybe a lot of things. You know, they're not serving the Lord. What is that? Well, they're not walking in newness of life. They have drifted away. And what this encourages here is our position in Christ actually provides for all of us the opportunity, the design to walk in newness of life. Let me, to wrap up very practically this morning... Let me develop a couple things on what does it mean to walk in newness of life. Go with me. So take that phrase. God wants us because we're attached to Christ. We too might. We too should. We are able to walk in newness of life. Go with me back over to Ephesians. And I'm going to highlight just a couple of these. These will be ones we'll develop in the series in the next few weeks. <clears throat> but Ephesians chapter 4. I read this briefly. Ephesians chapter 4. And Paul has done the same thing. In Ephesians, he has said, uh, God is sovereign. God saves by grace. Uh, God has designed the church, uh, the body of Christ, etc. And on all those truths, on those principles, on those doctrinal facts, he says in chapter 4, verse 1, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. And in this one, I'm, I'm, we'll develop these as messages down the road, but let me give you the quick summary. Verse number two, what does it mean to walk worthy? Well, to walk with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. That is one aspect of walking worthy. That's one aspect of walking in newness of life. Uh, go over a, a, probably a page or uh, approximately verse 17. Verse 17. And um, basically what I'm saying is Paul in Ephesians chapters 4, 5, and 6 is going to, in more detail, develop what does it mean to walk worthy? What does it mean to walk in newness of life? Chapter 4, verse 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. And so there's, there's certain ways you don't walk. Again, you, you know, I probably should have brought this up early on, but by walk... Um, we don't mean, you know, how long is your stride length or uh, what size shoe do you wear or anything like that, right? I mean, occasionally in the Bible, it, somebody walked to this town, it means that. But when Paul is using it, what does he mean? What does walk mean? It means how you live, your lifestyle, your habits, uh, your, your uh, passions, your, your desires, your um, decisions. All those kind of things that make up the life, the living, the walk. The, the, uh, and so when he's, in these passages, when he's talking about walking, he is talking about how you are living for Christ. And in this case, it's an, a negative. Don't do that. Don't walk like the pagans around you. You're going to walk differently. He's going to develop that. Uh, look over in chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in... Love. Walk in love. I, I, apparently, newness of life, walking in newness of life, includes loving God and loving our neighbor. All right? Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant uh, offering and sacrifice to God. Verse 8. Uh, it says uh, in the middle of a section here, but f for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as 
children of light. There's something about you know light. Again, does he mean you know always turn the, the light switch on? Obviously, that's he's speaking metaphorically. There's going to be a sense of walking in purity, in truth, in openness. Walk in the light. Uh, chapter 5, verse 15. I'll give you this last one. He says, look carefully. Watch out. Be aware. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, not as fools, but as wise. And these chapters flesh this out. And that's where he's going to go. So when we, the, the purpose this morning was to re-engage us with Ephesians the sections, the paragraphs through chapters 4, 5, and 6 in Ephesians are going to describe in some detail what it means to walk worthy, or in the language of Romans 6, 4, what it means and how to go about walking in newness of life. And so we want to encourage one another in that sense. And the, the other part, the other purpose of this message was, was to say, hey, it's a new year, but... You don't have to wait. If we get to, you know, a week from now or a month from now, and you, you don't have to wait till 2024 in order to make decisions and changes and develop new habits of walking for Christ. You can do that today, day by day. Living for Christ is very much a day by day thing. We live for Him one day at a time. And so this idea of this new life in Christ, walking in newness of life. We want to sing a chorus. The, the, it's the chorus the, the, uh, the choir opened with. And uh, hopefully you folks know, I think the, the choir seemed to know it pretty well. It's in the Maxi Hymnal 314. Uh, we will, we, this will probably show up a time or two in the next month. Uh, new life in Christ. I actually think there's a verse or two to it. If we can find that, 